Vamos. Few more seconds. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. <laughs> While I was learning and understanding this information, which began in 1971. Uh, basically, from 1971 until about roughly 1996 or 1997, somewhere around in there, I had an experience. Uh, long about that time that I couldn't understand. Uh, I was meditating in my Merkaba and I was spending a long time meditating in the Merkaba, an hour or more, and everything was sort of normal when suddenly I appeared, my body appeared inside of a cave and uh, it was a rel rather small cave. It was probably only as big as just this little side over here. And, and it was really real. It was just as real as this. And I couldn't figure out, you know, I was having the experience and then it went away after a while. And then it happened again and then again. And then it kept happening. I kept going back to the same place. And I had no idea what this was. As this began to happen, I had a friend, uh, Pete Carroll, who was the head coach for a football team, the New York Jets. And uh, he kept wanting me to get in contact with this woman. He said, you've you got to meet this lady. She's very unusual. And I kept going, well, yeah, but I'm really busy. I don't have time to do this. And so I kept putting them off and putting them off because I was so busy. Finally, after a few months, he says, look, you've got to do this. And so I'm gonna, he says, I'm going to take your phone number and give it to her so she can call you. And I said, okay, okay. And she called me, and her name was Marianne Shinfield. Uh, this woman was an anomaly. She was very, very unusual. She was completely blind, but she could see. She had no eyes, but she could watch television and read books. She could uh, walk around, down the steps, do anything. You would never know in a million years that she was blind. And I started talking to her, and she was not only unusual in that way, but she was unusual in lots of other ways because she um, was able to see not only the outer world, but she could see psychically in ways that were uh, extraordinary. Um, she told me how uh, NASA found out that she was blind but could see, and so they asked to do experiments with her. And uh, I wouldn't have done it. I would have said, nope, <laughs> sorry. But she did, and basically now they, she belongs to NASA. They're, they're with her all the time and constantly doing the experiments. But one of them was when the very beginning they asked her, okay, well, you can see, but what's going on in there? And she says, well, it's hard to explain, but I'm floating through space. And they said, what do you mean you're floating through space? And she says, well, I'm confined to the solar system, but I can move anywhere in the solar system, and, uh, and that's what I'm always doing, though my body is on Earth. And I think NASA probably said, sure, sure, because they made a test, and they said, okay, if you're really floating through space, then go along this particular satellite we have up there and read a number off of it, 
it's on the satellite, and, uh, and we'll believe you. So she did. She read the number off the satellite, and of course, every flag that the NASA had went up, and, uh, and they started using her. And they started having her go to different planets and look around and to all kinds of things. And, and, uh, and they began to realize that what she was seeing was just like being there. She was real. At the time that I met her was when uh, those 21 fragments of, uh, of the a planet of rock came through asteroids and they were the ones that went around the sun and came back and went and slammed into the... Uh, uh, the surface of Jupiter. You guys remember that? That was 96 or something like that. I don't remember when it was. And she was working with NASA at the time. She was going up to each one of those fragments right up to them and looking at them and describing them to NASA. So I'm talking to this lady on the phone and I, was, and I ended up talking to her for four months and for about once a week for about two hours. And, I, I, and it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. I've never met anyone like her. I've met people since then, but this was the first one I've ever met. And uh, after a few times of being with her, I, um, she said to me, uh, would you like to see through my eyes? The ones she doesn't have. <laughs> And, uh, and of course I said yes. And she said, okay, well then lay down on a bed and make everything dark. So we, my, my wife uh, sealed all the blinds off. And it was a new moon, so it was dark out anyway. And turned off all the lights. And I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. And then she had me prop the telephone up on, my, on a pillow so that I could completely relax while I was doing it. And then it took a while. It took maybe 10 minutes of her saying, do you see yet? Do you see yet? I'm going, no, I don't see anything. When suddenly, just like a light switch coming on, this phenomenon took place. Sitting in front of me, maybe only this far in front of me, was a television screen or a computer monitor, whatever you want to call it. But it was like in that shape. It was about that big. And when you look, but it was really more like a window. Because when you look through it, it was just like looking outside, only instead of looking outside, I saw stars. It, it, was, it was just the same stars I see up here, but I could look through and see the stars. And, uh, and around this television screen were little tiny TV screens that were about two inches by three inches. And they were mounted all around the outer edge of the screen. And they had images that were moving on them very, very fast. I mean, they were just going blink, 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 blink. About as, you could recognize them, but as, as, they were moving as fast as you could possibly recognize and still see what they were. And she drew my attention to the top right-hand one up here. She says, look at that one. I'm looking at it. And, and there were images of real pictures of, like, trees or animals or chairs or things mixed in with geometrical images. They were shuffled together moving really fast. And she said, that window tells me what's around my body on Earth. So I can look at that and, and watch television or read a book or walk around or open a refrigerator because I know what's in, around my body. And uh, she then, then told me the window on the bottom left side. She only told me two windows out of all these windows. And this one over here, she says, this is how I talk to my brothers and sisters. Well, there were ETs on this thing, and so she, what she was talking about is other ET races that she could communicate uh, through here. And uh, let me make a long story short. Um, basically, I had a long experience with her. It was about two hours long, and I was looking through her eyes, and we went down, we looked at the comets, and we saw all these different things happen. And then after that, uh, she only did this one time, and then after that, we communicated in uh, images and mixed in with uh, geometrical images. That was the, uh, the whole communication. It was a kind of a strange thing talking to somebody. She'd say, okay, an uh, uh, icosahedron and now a tree and things like this. And, and she'd make me draw them down. And somehow I just knew what she was talking about on really deep levels this way. 
And then after four months, it ended. We both agreed that we were done with whatever we were doing. She left. I've never seen her since. But this phenomena of seeing this inner screen with these little screens around it, uh, that was a, I've, I've got a, oh, I got a lot of very unusual experiences. I don't know how I got them, but I've got them. And I've, and I've got this little file I call my weird file. <laughs> and I put these kind of things away. I don't discount them or anything, but I just wait to see if they'll just connect with something else on some other level. Because I couldn't tie what she was doing into anything else that I knew. <clears throat> Several years went by, maybe three, four years went by. And I was here in Mexico giving a workshop. Uh, it was a, I think it was an Earth Sky workshop, which is an advanced level of the Flower of Life. And I was talking about <clears throat> uh, another phenomenon that was going on in China. Um, in 1974, uh, the Chinese discover the Chinese government discovered this young Chinese boy. I think he was about 10 or 12 years old, <clears throat> who could see with his ears. He could see with his ears just as well as you could see with your eyes. They could, they could seal his eyes off. They could duct tape them off. And, and he could still see perfectly just by turning his eyes, his ears around and, and seeing. Well, if it was only one kid, then that would be kind of like Marianne Shinfield. It would just be one, um, one person. But... Uh, they then found another one, and then another one, then another one. And then they started having, finding ones that could see with different parts of their bodies. One could see with his ears, one could see with the tip of his nose, one could see with his mouth, with the tip of his tongue. Others could see with their armpits. <laughs> uh, some could see with their feet or their hands. Uh, some could see with their hair. I think those are all the different parts that they could see with. And, uh, and so they would choose different ones. And some could see with more than one part. Some could see with two or three different areas of their body at once. Sounds outrageous. But um, it, th this, this phenomena is not... Uh, it, it, it's absolutely scientifically documented on every level of science within our world. Uh, uh, it's now been documented through Nature Journal, which is one of the most prestigious journals in, in, the, United, in the world, as well as Science News and Omni Magazine and on and on and on that have, uh, they don't understand it, but they have documented that it's fact and it's true. They've now found 100,000 children that can do this. It's not just two or three. And they're still showing up in mass now more and more and more. That was uh, about eight years ago. They were at 100,000. Now it's just climbing right out of, off the scale. And uh, nobody, though so far, nobody's been able to figure out what the heck it means or, or why they can do that. Omni Magazine was uh, now first from 1974 until 1984 the Chinese government and the scientific community there discounted it completely and said it was fake. In fact, they even made newspapers dis dedicated only to the propaganda of, of letting the Chinese population believe that this was a fake. Until 1984, when they reached that's when they reached 100,000 was in 1984, and then there just became so many of these kids everywhere that were doing it that uh, they finally gave in. And, uh, and realize that it was true, and that's when the rest of the world began to realize it was true. And then they, instead of this, denying it, they began to make um, a schools to collect them, to begin to study them. And then, uh, and then once they collected them up, they began to find out that these kids could not just see without their eyes, they can do anything they thought of. They can just think of something and just do it, even if it broke all the laws of physics in ways that we can't even understand. They had one kid who was able to put, and this is what, under scientific uh, scrutiny, the scientists would put a table out here, 
and the kid had to stand across the room, not near it, the scientist would take a bottle of pills that was sealed and put it in the middle. And then they were to put an object off to the side, like a, a coin or a marble or something. And then this little kid, who's like six years old, would come over here and go, okay, now. And all the pills would go right through the glass without breaking it and stack up on the table. And then the object would lift up in the air, float over to the bottle, and go right into the sealed bottle, and it's totally sealed. One kid did it, then another, then another, and then another, then a hundred, then a thousand, and finally 5,000 Chinese kids were able to duplicate that. It's all been documented with science. And, uh, and then it started to get more and more outrageous. Then this little girl uh, said, oh, I can do another one. She was six years old. And she made an audience come together of about a thousand people. And as they walked in, she gave them a rosebud, a tight rosebud. You know, you know, small, tight little rosebud. And they didn't know why they were getting these. And they all sat down. And she, and she came on stage and said, okay, hold the rosebud up. And everybody held the rosebud up. And she says, okay, now. And all the rosebuds opened up. Can't be a trick. You know, how did she do that? And then it just kept going, and it kept getting more and more outrageous. I mean, to things that they, these kids began to do things on the same level that Jesus was doing things. Literally. They have scientifically documented two of these children walking right through a solid wall. They're obviously breaking all the laws of physics that we know, but they're doing it. And we can't seem to do anything about it. They're just doing it. Omni Magazine was sent there in, in 19, late 1984 to check it out, see if it was real. And they were given 100 or so of these kids. These kids are all from about 6 years old to about 14 years old. And uh, Omni said in the article, and you can read everything I'm about to tell you, it was in January 1985 when Omni made this article, so you can just go on the website and get it and read it, that uh, they assumed that the Chinese government, government was just making a trick or something. And so uh, they made up their own uh, ideas of how they could prove it or test it. And one of the tests was that they took a big stack of Chinese books and they got the children there in a row, in a room. And they just assumed that they had hidden cameras or things like that. So they just pulled a book out at random, flipped open a random page, and before anybody could see it, just ripped it out, crumpled it up, and stuck it under their arm, then walked over to the kids and put it under their arm while it's still in their hand and no one could see it, put their arm down. Every one of these kids could read that page, both sides of it, perfectly. Over and over and over, 100% accurate, not even with a tiny error or once. And they kept making all these kinds of tests, going, well, what is this, you know? I mean, this is not normal psychic ability. This is, usually most psychics are like 60% right or 80% right. They were 100% right every time, whatever they did. So anyway, I was in Mexico giving a workshop here. And I was talking about these kids in China, and what, that what was been written, what was written up about them. And... Um, a young lady, 18 years old, a Mexican girl from Mexico City, she goes, oh, I can do that stuff. And I go, you can? <laughs> she goes, oh, yeah, I do it all the time. I've been doing it for years. She says, would you like, to, would you like me to show you? And we go, <laughs> and we say no, you know. And, yeah, of course. So she came up, and she, her name was Inga. She was dressed in all white. She was beautiful. And uh, she came up, and I says, okay, it's all yours. Here's the stage. And so she sat down, and she says, okay, first of all, are there anybody in here that's skeptical, that, that doesn't believe that I can see without my eyes? And everybody sat there, and finally two young men stood up and said, oh, come on, you can't see without your eyes. And she goes, well, would you two come up here then? And she sat them down and says, here's what I'm going to do. And she took a tissue paper and uh, put it in their eyes, 
and then had this long gold scarf and wrapped the scarf around and around and around around their eyes with a, with a tissue paper so nothing would go out until she said, now, can you see? And the guy goes, no, I can't see a thing. Okay, and she did it to the other guy. He says, can you see? He goes, no, I can't see a thing. She says, okay, do it to me. So they put the, the tissue paper into the eyes and wrap this thing around and make sure it's out there. She says, are you satisfied that I can't see? She goes, they go, yeah, I don't think you can see. And he says, okay. So they went back and sat down. And she says, and I didn't know what she was going to do. I had no idea. And she says, would somebody... Uh, give me a, a photograph. And so a woman just reached in her purse and pulled out a photograph and handed it to her. She, it was handed to her upside down. She immediately turned it right side up and her finger went like this. And so then she describes the photograph as though she's just looking at it perfectly. It was a, a couch sitting in a... In a living room with four people on the living on the couch with just a, a photograph I mean a, a painting behind the couch and it's not just an ordinary photograph and uh, and so she describes it in detail the color the people there were three females and a male da, 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 like that and she says and, and I thought that was it I thought that was it and, says, and I started to reach for the photograph and she said is there anything you'd like to know about this photograph? And the lady says, well, what do you mean? She says, I can tell you anything. I can tell you who took the photograph, what their name is and their phone number is, and what they were thinking at the time, if you want. I can walk through your house. I can tell you where your house is. I can give you your name and address and phone number. I can tell you all the names of the people on the couch or anything you want. What do you want? She goes, you can? She goes, okay. Uh, go to the right of the picture and tell me what's there. And there was nothing there. You couldn't see anything. And she goes, well, you got a hallway right there, and the first door on the left is your bedroom. She went in and described her bedroom in detail, the colors, where the bed was, even went over to her nightstand and told her what was sitting on the nightstand. Then she went out across the door into the next one, which was into her bathroom, and described the bathroom exactly, the colors, the size, the shape, what it was, and everything. And the woman says, that's enough. She says, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and so she handed her back and she says, is there anybody else has a photograph? Well, one of these guys uh, jumps up and says, come on, you rigged this before. You, you, you know this lady. She gave you the thing. He says, let me give you something of mine. She goes, okay. So he reaches in his wallet and gives her, her his driver's license. But he turns it upside down and backwards when he hands it to her. She immediately turns it right side up and frontwards. And her little finger goes like this. She goes, it's your driver's license. And she reads off the numbers and addresses and all the stuff on there like that. And he goes, I don't know how you're doing it, but you're faking this somehow. And he says, you're not, you, you are not convincing me. Um, tell me something that only I know. That, that only I know. No one else knows. And this little smile comes on her face. She goes, okay. And he was there with her girlfriend. She was sitting next to her, but he was standing up here now. And he goes, you have two girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and their names are da-da-da-da-da-da, which was one of them that was here. And they don't know about each other. And he, he starts to go on further. <laughs> and he, she's up straight in her chair. <laughs> <laughs> and he grabs the license plate out of her, or the thing out of her, and she goes, that's enough, and walks down and sits down, and she's, <laughs> and just, and we didn't hear from him ever again. And, um, and then uh, other photographs were handed to her by lots of people, lots and lots of people, and she could go into those photographs and just tell you everything. In fact, there isn't anything that she couldn't tell you. Anything you can think of. She could give you the birth date. She could tell you where you were born. She could even tell you the day you're going to die, down to the minute and where and how. Uh, she could tell you anything in the future. Tell you anything. Uh, as outrageous as it seems, that audience was pretty shocked, I'm sure. Well, later, uh, 
I brought her to my house. We become very good friends, and uh, along with her mother, Nima, and uh, and I for three days, I uh, performed all kinds of experiments, and some experiments that were uh, you just couldn't fake, not in a million years. I had a whole bunch of bottles of water that we were analyzing, and they were just lettered A, B, C, D, like that. And they all looked the same, except in them were different chemical makeups. Well, she was able to uh, hold the bottle just for a second and tell me exactly what was in the water. Some of those bottles of water, I knew what it was, so she couldn't could have been getting it from my mind. But there were about half of them. I had no idea, and some guy in some lab somewhere in the world knew where it was. But she still nailed every single one of them right. And I kept going on all kinds of things, and it didn't matter what I did. She was 100% perfect on everything. And this was fascinating. Then finally, we were after a couple of days I was sitting here, and we were doing a break. She was just sitting, hanging out on the couch, and I was hanging out on the couch. And we were breaking, we are not doing we are just talking. And I said, uh, Inga, I was curious. I, I said, what do you see when you close your eyes and you're blindfolded? What do you see inside? What happened? What's going on in there? And she, kept, she said, oh, it's not important. And I, kept, I said, well, yeah, it is. I, I'm, just try to, I, I'm curious. Just try to tell me what's going on inside there, you know, in your head. And she didn't want to tell me, and I had to keep pushing it. And finally, like about 10 minutes of pushing her, she says, well, it's weird. That's why I don't want to tell you. It looks like a little computer screen inside there with these little tiny computer screens around the outside. I almost fell off the couch. That was the last thing in the, in the world I thought she was going to tell me. I mean, here it was, exactly the same as Marianne Shenfield. I said, I know what that is. She goes, I know you know what that is. <laughs> she says, that was the, she says I, the reason I came to your workshop was because I saw your poster. And when I saw the poster, I knew you were connected to this. And that's why I wanted to connect with you. And I says, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, so when she left, after she left, uh, then I'm thinking, well, do all the kids in China also see this inner screen? So there was a book written about these kids in China called China's Super Psychics. And it was written by a man named Paul Dong. So I found out where he was. And he was in California. He was 72 years old. And I called him up. Really nice guy. We talked for about two hours. And it was, it was really, I got lots of good information. But somewhere in that conversation, I said to him, uh, Paul, you've been studying these kids for 15 years or so. What do they see inside their head? And he went through the same thing. He didn't want to tell me. And finally he says, well, I don't really know. I've never experienced it. But a lot of these kids tell us they see some kind of computer screen or television screen inside their head. And I says, they have these little windows around the outside. And he goes, I don't know anything about that. Uh, all they say is it's uh, some kind of screen that they see inside their head. And I'm going, and so now all of my little wheels in my head are going, wow, you know, I know what this is. And, uh, and it's all tied to, to darkness. They, they go in and they seal their eyes off, just like Marianne Shenfield, who was blind. They don't want any light. Not any. They don't want fo one photon getting in there if they can. They want it completely dark. And this is a huge key in the new consciousness that's unfolding. I found out from her that there were two schools here in Mexico City that teach this. And that she had over a thousand friends that could do this in Mexico City. Other Mexican kids that were able to see with their hands or their feet or other levels and could know anything about what they're looking at. Uh, then I found out that there were three schools in Russia. And I was able to uh, uh, do research when I was in Russia around all of this. And uh, they've known about it for a long time. They're far more uh, advanced in Russia over Mexico or China. 
they've got kids there that can do things that, that uh, these kids have never thought about. That's the whole thing. One kid has to think of something, and then all, all the, once they think of something, then all the other kids says, oh, I can do that, and they can do the same thing. It's just like they just have to imagine something, and they're there. They're there. The kids in Russia can just pick up a book, hold it for a second, and they got the book, not only on their inner screen like a computer where they can scroll down and look at it, but they instantaneously know everything that that author knows about that subject. They know it all. Whatever he knew they, or she knew, they know. And, um, and lots and lots and lots. I mean, I'm, I'm just touching on some of the subjects of what they've done. Uh, they're able, the Chinese are even able to change DNA molecules. Uh, just by looking at them, and they can they, through scientific study where they're looking at the molecule, and and the kids just look at it, and they can actually alter the the codons and everything in, in, inside that, which in, implies awesome possibilities of of evolution. And so, at any rate, to make a long story short, again, these kids are beginning to pop up everywhere, and it's all tied to an ability to see in darkness rather than in light. With a lot of research and a lot of study, since I know this is true because I had the experience, it's not like I'm uh, guessing. Uh, I know, I understand what they're doing. Um, I've been doing a lot of research around this. Recently, I took a group to... Uh, through the Four Corners area of the United States, doing ceremony uh, with the Anasazi Indians. And uh, when I was in the Navajo Nation, <clears throat> we were going into something called Antelope Cam Canyon. And it belongs to the Navajo Nation, and it, it's, a, it's one of the most remarkable places I've ever been in my life. But uh, when we were <clears throat> to get there, the only way they'll do it is they, if you, they make you get out of the car and they drive you there. They won't. They won't. Uh, they won't let you go there. And this Navajo shaman, he was maybe 35, 40 years old, uh, and his two grandmothers, uh, who were in their 50s and 60s, well, probably 60s, 60s at least, um, they each drove a truck out to about 20 miles on this dirt road out to where we were. And so we got out there. And I had a group of about 55 people that we were going around with. And he, this man, um, uh, Darwin was his name, uh, he took us through the canyon to the other side. He got to the other side. He told us stories. He's looking at us and going through this whole thing. He took us back. He sang us peyote songs, did all this thing for us. We got back to the other side, and he's out on the other side, and he's showing us the snake natural snake pattern on the outside of this, leading into the, this canyon. And he's describing all the details in it, and he's telling us, look here and here. And as he's doing that, I'm standing here next to his grandmother, and she goes, it's really amazing, isn't it? I go, what? I mean, he's doing all these things, and he's absolutely blind. He can't see anything. I go, you mean he drove me out here in the truck? <laughs> <laughs> and he's blind. <laughs> he goes, yep. <laughs> so I got back in the truck with this guy, and he drove me out there. He's completely blind. He's driving down this road like crazy, you know. And uh, he's another one of them. They're all over the place. Uh, in Russia, they can train any blind person to do this. They can take a blind person and teach them how to see. It takes about two years of training, unless you're under 14, and they can do it in about two weeks. But... Uh, uh, there's a whole other world opening up here. Something uh, extraordinary is occurring in the world. And uh, they're fi uh, Jimmy Twyman's finding them in Bulgaria. They're, they're popping up everywhere now. And these are called the super psychic children. These are not the indigo kids. The indigo kids are connected to wherever there are lots of computers. They, it's a whole another another phenomenon that's occurring at the same time while this other one is occurring, and you can almost count the, 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 the how many computers there are per capita and tell how many indigos are, are inside of there. And they have another thing happening. They can't do this kind of stuff with their hands and feet and everything. So what's it all about? 
And what is this uh, special thing that uh, they are bringing to this world, and why are they doing it? Well, this is my opinion, and you may come up to another one. But what I've learned is that there is a place inside of your heart. It was known in ancient times. It's been almost completely forgotten now. But there is a sacred space inside of your heart that if spirit learns how to leave the mind, and I mean absolutely, literally, go out of the head and travel through the body and go into the heart and then find this sacred opening and go inside that sacred opening and then find another tiny sacred space inside that heart that God resides there. God is everywhere, but boy, is God there. And when you enter into that space, you and God become one. And all things are possible. And all knowledge is present there. You can know anything. And you can see out into the outer world from that space. You can connect back to it, even though you are inside of your heart in darkness. You can connect back into this outer world out here and know anything, past, present, or future. What it means, ultimately, I can only tell you what I think it means. Because we're going to all have to live this. We're all going to go through this. We're all going to remember this at one point in, in, in this. Uh, it's tied to the creation itself. When, when someone prays to God for something, when they sit down and in all honesty pray, perhaps for their wife or mother or son or daughter to be healed of something, or themselves, or something else. When they go in and they sincerely pray, most of the time nothing happens. Zero. But sometimes something does happen. Sometimes a miracle occurs. And people very often don't know why. It's just, you have ten people praying, nothing happens, and one of them... A miracle occurs. Well, the science of miracles was written down, I don't know how long ago it was, it was over 2,000, 2,500 years ago, what, however old the Dead Sea Scrolls were. Uh, they found another scroll near the Dead Sea Scrolls that Greg Braden uh, has written into a book called The Isaiah Effect. And the exact details of how you create a miracle were done there. You have to include your mind, your heart, and your body, all at the same time, if you leave out any one of those pieces, nothing happens. But what Greg has found, we've sat and talked about this for a long time, and we're all coming to the same conclusion, the people at work in this, is that, yeah, you can create miracles from the mind. You can do it. You can do things that are just extraordinary from the mind. Psychic abilities, I've worked with, this, with the, the Monroe Institute. I've worked with the Berkeley Psychic Institute. I've done, I've done and seen things that most people would never believe, but I've seen it. But nevertheless, it's still coming from the mind. But the mind has one big problem. The mind is a polarized instrument. that is polarized left and right. It's polarized again with the front and back lobes. Everything in it as it looks out into this one reality, sees everything is polarized, and anything that it creates through this mind always creates a polarized reality. And so if you're praying for world peace, you're going to get world peace, but you're also going to get world war. If you're what you pray for, if you're in the mind and you do it, you're going to get the sides of the coin, both the light and the dark of that thing. And you can't help it because the instrument that you're doing it through is polarized. But if you learn how to leave the mind and go into the sacred place in the heart, you can create from there. The heart doesn't know polarization. It only knows oneness and unity. It cares about all levels of life and doesn't see any particular level of life as more important than any other level of creating, it 
doesn't have any thought patterns or logic in it at all. It uses the dream process. And it uses feelings and emotions. It's feminine rather than masculine. And it doesn't and because it isn't using logic, things don't have to get from A to B logically. Psychic phenomena, you can actually track all psychic phenomena and explain it. The military's been working with that for years, both Russian and Chinese and the United States that I know of for sure. You can track every psychic phenomena back exactly. You could explain it on how it took place. But you can't explain the, the creation patterns that happen from the heart. Uh, if, you, if you do the psychic patterns from the mind, it will appear as a coincidence. But if you do the psychic if you do it from the heart, it appears out of nowhere. If you're trying to get an apple in your hand, uh, and you're doing it psychically, uh, there's going to be some logical pattern where someone was doing it. I, I used to always try to, I knew all this, and I was trying to experiment with it before I knew about the heart. So I was always trying to manifest an orange. I, was, I used to sit for hours. There's an orange in my hand. I could see it. I could feel it. Da, 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 da. Trying to make this orange happen in my hand. And, uh, and it never would happen. But I kept, I kept believing in it, and I kept trying it, because I knew the possibilities of what it was doing it. And then one day I was in a meditation group with about six or seven people. We were all sitting there meditating. And I was meditating for about an hour. And then I said, I'm going to try this orange thing. Nobody knew I was doing it but me. And so I held my little hand out here like that. And I said, there's an orange in my hand. I can feel it. I'm thinking about it. I'm sitting there. And somebody in the room, went in the other room, came in there and dropped an orange in my hand. The impact was incredible. <laughs> I just went, whoa, it's there. And she says, you gave me the orange? And it was a logical sequence. I did it. I actually did it. But it was a logical sequence. But if you were in your heart and did that same thing, it would actually appear out of nothing. There doesn't have to be any logic to it. There doesn't have to be any nothing. It just can happen without any... Uh, science behind it or anything else like that. It's pure feminine creativity. This is where we're going, hopefully, that we can get out of our heads, out of our minds, into our hearts, where our hearts can control our minds rather than our minds controlling our hearts. We don't have any wisdom from our heart, from our minds. We're, we can make incredible science. We can do amazing logical things but we have no wisdom and we're killing our planet with this brilliant science that we're doing that's coming from our mind. But we could do the same science and the same things from within our heart. Wouldn't do any harm to anybody anywhere at all. So there is a way, and I can't explain it now, but there is a way where your heart can gain control of the mind. And that's uh, what this workshop that we're about to go into is. I mean, all I can do is give an introduction right now. I can't take you down into that place. It takes three days to get there, so I can't do it. I know of. But just with what I'm talking about, you've seen all this logical stuff. You've seen the stuff of the mind. The Merkaba is of the mind also. But the toroidal fields, I'll just tell you the secret, the toroidal fields of the macabre, of the mind, and the toroidal fields of the heart. Yes, the heart has toroidal fields. Uh, Stanford University has scientifically proven this. They found that the most powerful electromagnetic field that's emitted from the human body does not come from the mind, but comes from the heart. And it's big. It's an electromagnetic field that extends 8 to 10 feet out from around the body, and it's in the shape of a torus, again, that do donut shape. And the axis runs down right through the heart, and it, which happens to run exactly through the sacred space, because that's the generator of it. And, uh, and so you have the axis of the Merkaba right over here. At one point in the development, the axis of the heart and the axis of the Merkaba link and the Merkaba field synchronized, 
and this phenomena takes place, which is the next level. It's the second level of the Merkaba. And this is where, this is what we're in the process of learning how to remember what this is about. Finally, there will be a third level that's coming, that, that it may not be me, it might be you, it might be someone in the world that will understand it. But once the heart links with the mind and gains control of the mind, then the sexual energy of the body takes on a whole new purpose and meaning. What's associated with creativity, the creation? How is a new human being born? It's through conception and it's through sexual energy that that takes place. When sexual energy is used in a very pure way, used through the heart patterns and through the mind of the Merkaba, true creation can actually take place. Anything is possible at that point. And this is where we're leading to. And this is how we're going to get out of these problems that we've got, that we have created in our mind. I wish I could go deeper into all of this, uh, but I really can't without a lot more training uh, that I could take you through. But it's all I can do right now. now there is one thing, and, I, and I've been asked to do this. Uh, uh, one of the problems of people being able to get into the heart, no matter how much study you do or how much work you do, uh, what I've discovered is that uh, some people can't get in there because they have emotional trauma in their heart. They've been rejected by a mate or they've had a divorce or something's happened that has hurt so bad that they've sealed it. And when they go into their heart, they feel that pain and they go back out and they go, I can't go in there, it hurts. And so in many different shades of that same experience, for one reason or another, they can't get in there. And the only way that they can, we can get them in there is through healing the emotional heart of their, of their heart space. And so we have developed a system in the, in the school to do that, but it's not real good. Um, ideally, you actually uh, have therapy. You go through therapy to, re, to solve the emotional problems before you begin to do this heart work. This would be the most perfect thing to do. And there are many really good people out there in the world. We're, we're very fortunate that now because they're all over. The science has been developed very high. Uh, my wife is also involved in this, and she has a system that's 4,000 years old that came from the original people who first wrote about the Merkaba. Uh, she's trained as a psychologist in, from Harvard and all this stuff, but... She just threw that out. She says that was useless for what she learned and studied from the people who had learned this. Uh, they were all a 96-year-old lady in Jerusalem that held this pattern. And so there is, a, there is ways we're using images that are inside the body to solve these problems completely so that you can go into the heart just like that. And, uh, and so uh, if this is something that you think you may be involved in, or any, really, truly, any other aspect of spiritual work, no matter where the, what it is or what level it is that you're working in, the emotional body must be healed first. They knew this in Egypt, and they knew it in Greece, they knew it all over. And uh, so, but anyway, m my wife will be here, when is it, in September? September, September 7th, okay, so approximately that time. And uh, if you're interested in her helping you in that way, um, Conchita can help you. You can find other ways. That's not the only, my wife's not the only way. There's lots of other people out there that can help you. But without that emotional balance, you can't do this properly. It won't work. So this is uh, what the work is. Uh, uh, this is what the flower of life is involved in, these three levels. The first one is the Merkava. The second one has to do with the heart and the heart spaces and what's involved in that. And finally to work with the sexual energy and how to uh, work with all of that. And though the sexual uh, uh, programs will probably not be out there for at least a year or two. So, that's it. Now, if there's any questions, 
I'll do what I can to answer them. If you have a question, uh, if you could come up here to this microphone and ask the question, uh, I'll do it. If you, uh, if you feel to go now, you can. It's up to you. You don't have to do this. But if you want to uh, watch or if, you, if there's something else that you want to follow through there, I'll stay here until we, for another half hour or so. Sí, vamos But a dedicar algún momento para preguntas. Las personas que deseen hacer preguntas, si se acercan aquí y hacen una fila, por favor, y les vamos dando el micrófono. Vamos a dedicar un poco de tiempo, no demasiado, este, porque no podemos estarnos toda la noche, pero lo que podamos es que nos emocionamos y luego aquí no nos vamos nunca. Este, si alguien quiere acercarse. Yo quería saber un poco de los niños índigos. Uh, The indigo children are, um, okay, if you look at the mind, it's divided into the left and the right side. The left side is male and logical. The right side is female and emotional. Uh, the planet, Earth, is divided in the same way. It's not a straight line, but there are areas of the Earth that are associated with the left brain and areas that are associated with the right brain. Uh, the, uh, you know, like India and Tibet are in the right brain, and the United States and Germany are definitely in the left brain. And uh, uh, what, what's the psychic children that we were, have been talking about that can see with their hands and feet fall into the right brain. The indigo children fall into the left brain of the planet, and they are uh, logical and very intelligent. Uh, their IQ is very high. Uh, it's uh, somewhere in the 130s, 136 or so is approximately in there. Uh, that used to be one child in 10,000, and now it's becoming normal. And uh, these kids usually, though, don't have a, uh, a it's, they don't have a broad spectrum in genius. They usually have uh, spikes or certain areas. Uh, that, in other words, they're only a genius in the areas they like things that they want to do. And in the areas that they like and they want to do, they're incredible. They're, you can't hardly measure their intelligence in those areas. And um, they are slightly psychic. They know, uh, they know what you're thinking and feeling, but uh, that's pretty much the extent of it, of at least what I've been able to see. Uh, so if you're a parent of them and you're trying to raise them using the old guidelines, you know, Uh, it doesn't work. It absolutely, you just end up in a mess because they know what you're thinking. <coughs> and so if you lie to them, they know you're lying. And if you lie to them very much, they won't listen to you anymore. And uh, so you can't say no to them either. You have to explain to them and talk to them as though they're an adult because they're really intelligent, even though they're just little kids. Uh, the United States is trying to figure out what to do right now. Uh, Lee Carroll's book, uh, The Indigo Kids, which was written, that was not written by Lee Carroll or Jan Tabor. It was a, it was a summation of the works of many psychic, I mean, uh, psychologists and doctors and uh, people who were in, uh, in the testing of these children. And, uh, and it's very clear that there is a phenomenon going on in the world that we don't quite understand um, um, besides the one with the super psychic kids. And it's changing everything. Where you're going to find these kids is where there's computers. Uh, the highest computer ratio in the world is in Israel, and that's where you're going to find the highest ratio. Uh, but the United States is very high in them also. And by 1984, um, they began to see them coming in in mass. And by the time he wrote his book, which I don't remember when it was, in 1997 or so, where uh, 80 to 90 percent of all the children being born in the United States were indigo kids. At this point today, it's near, if not at, 100%. Every single kid, just about. But that's because the United States is such a left-brain country. Uh, Mexico's kind of got both going on. You've got some indigos and some super psychics going on. You've got both things happening at once. And so uh, you can't just say, well, I got an indigo kid. I mean, you've got to really kind of look at it and see what's going on there because uh, you don't know. How did, how did Inga's mother know that she had a, uh, a super psychic kid? It was real obvious. She told me herself. She said when, the, when Inga was six months old, she was laying in her crib and asleep, 
and and she heard some noises and she walked into the into the room and this little baby had taken all of her toys that were around the room and they were floating over her bed and she was sitting there playing with them as they were floating in the air she knew for sure <laughs> and um so, but the indigo kids are harder to see because they, they look more normal. And, uh, but, but they're, and, and these kids are, are, from what all the people who are studying these kids, and especially the psychics who are studying them, they're not from Earth. They're from, they're, 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 we're, we are infusing very high levels of awareness from other places, certain regions of space and time and dimension, that have agreed to come into Earth at this time to raise our consciousness because if we if somebody doesn't do this, we're not going to make it because we don't have enough <laughs> consciousness to be able. We've got some things coming in the future very soon that are big, really big, and we have to be able to be on another level to be able to deal with these things. And that's what they're doing. Is they're coming here to help us. And uh, and so I I could go on for another hour probably, but that's uh, what the that's the essence of what the indigo kids are. You know, maybe I missed it, but before we were out for the break, you mentioned you were going to tell us when we came back about the mess. The message? Yes. Uh, you mentioned about a message that the, um, the other civilization was uh, trying to transmit to us. Where, was the, was, did that go through the translation? Oh, the plasma ships. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, what they, what they, okay, their message, what they are, what their message is, as I understand it from them, is exactly what I'm talking about. The thing that we need to know about ourselves is, is about our heart, and that if we know that we can go in there, we can change the outer world. All the polluted oceans, the ozone, the problems, the stuff, all the things that, are, that look hopelessly um, like you can't fix them, well you can, and and more if we learn to change from our mind to our heart and get inside of there, and eventually this leads into a place where you become pure light, and uh, and whatever you think happens, whatever you feel, whatever you dream actually happens. Uh, the message though will have to be delivered by them and exactly how they want it, but I know that it is in this area of what this message is. I can't tell you exactly what they're going to say, but it is in that area what what they they want to say to us. It's about all I can say on that. Okay. I read in your uh, web website many years ago uh, about uh, about the wa water of life or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, what what's mm -hmm. about that uh, water now? Is healing the, the water? Well, we've been studying water for I don't know. 12, 14 years, uh, water is way more than you know. Uh, there is potential in water that is, uh, all of our energy problems could be over with water in ways that we can't even imagine right now. Uh, the, the, what we're finding is incredible, but along that line of testing, we came across a water that came out of Turkey, and, uh, and that water held the potential of healing all the rivers and lakes and everything of the, of the environment. Uh, it was a very unusual water, uh, and I, we studied this at SAIC, which is a government thing in, in Washington, D.C. They showed how you can just take a, this water and just put a, you can take a lamp and just stick a plug in it, and it'll light up the lamp brighter than if you plugged it in the wall. And, uh, and it, it, you could take polluted water and put a little bit in there and just watch it go clear. Uh, it was amazing potential, but the people that were behind it were not very nice and had hidden agendas and uh, had stolen the formula and uh, weren't telling the truth, and we had to drop it. Uh, fortunately, something even better has just come along, and we're speaking, which is very similar to that water, and we're speaking with the Mexican government right now to see if we can introduce this into the water system of Mexico uh, it is the most unusual substance that uh, chemistry has ever seen. Uh, Texas A&M University, who is analyzing this right now, uh, we were just talking to them, said they have never seen anything like it. They didn't even know it could possibly exist. Uh, but uh, 
we have learned how to nan analyze uh, minerals, and we and it's all it is is water with 72. Uh, it's a substance, deuterium, with uh, heavy water, with 72 minerals, uh, 18 amino acids, and pure liquid oxygen. But they've been nanoized, meaning that the minerals are 100,000 times smaller than an angstrom. And they're so small that they pass right through cells and nourish uh, cells and give it everything it needs. And so uh, you, can you can do things with it. You can, they're healing AIDS. They're healing cancer. They're doing everything with this. And uh, uh, they believe they can heal any virus in the world, actually, right now with this. And SARS can be healed with this, too. We, we believe it. We, AIDS has been demonstrated by universities, and so has cancer. Uh, SARS, there should be no reason why SARS, because it's just another polyhedron. But uh, uh, this water, we hope, will be introduced into Mexico because it is the best water purifier that the world has ever seen. Uh, right now, you're using chlorine, which is a deadly poison. And, uh, and it's really a bad thing to put in water. And it doesn't last long. If you take chlorine out of the water, the water goes dirty very soon. You can take a fish tank with 20 gallons in it and put six drops of this in there, and the water will stay absolutely clean and pure for six to nine months. And so, uh, and, but the thing about this is it's a water purifier. It's totally non-toxic. But the reservoirs and lakes and rivers that have this, anything that's in those lakes, the fish, the uh, bacteria and everything, it will uh, cure it. It will make it healthy. The birds that drink from it will get healthy. The trees will get healthy. We have a group in Texas, a bunch of cowboys, who said, well, I'm going to make a business out of this, these guys. And so they're going to buy in the old cows that have cancer in their body and their skin and bones. And they can buy these for 12 cents a pound because nobody wants them. They can't sell them. And they're taking these old beat-up cows and bringing them back and feeding them this water. And all their cancer is going away and they're getting fat and healthy and selling them and making money. And they think it's a great thing. But uh, we, this water holds a huge potential, and my feeling is that uh, I'm hoping that Mexico will be able to do the testing and see what it is and introduce it into the water system. It's a good thing. It's a really good thing. Turkish water, unfortunately, you're never going to see it happen because they could only make little tiny quantities of it. Okay. Algunos de los niños psíquicos que pudieron ver el futuro dijeron algo acerca del futuro de la humanidad. Uh, what psychic children? ¿Qué niños psíquicos? Algunos de los niños super psíquicos que comentó que podían ver el futuro. Did you say that the super psychic ones see the future, so if they say something about the future? Well, here's what I know and what I believe, combination of both, with these super psychic children. Uh, first of all, uh, Inga and other ones that I've talked to uh, are having a really hard time because uh, like when Inga was going through high school and dating, for example, uh, she'd date a guy, but she knew everything he was thinking. And she realized the guy didn't really like her. All, she, all he wanted was her body. And, uh, and, so, and she knew everything that was going on, and so she ended up isolating herself in a room and just sitting there and would, didn't want to go out and see people because she could look at everyone and knew everything, and she said, basically, everyone's crazy and, and didn't want to deal with it. Well, they're all having that kind of problem. And um, at the same time, the, the indigo kids are seeing this also on another level, the indigo, these kids in like in the United States and other places that are running around with machine guns and killing all the kids in schools, those are indigo kids because they're, they're just so angry that, that they're in this world that is uh, so messed up. Uh, it's okay. They're going to go through all this stuff, but they're slowly going to begin to link. And I knew this from 1971. The angels talked about them for a long time, told me that they were coming, told me that they would begin to come in 1972. Science has only been able to figure it, document it back to 1974, but I know they started actually in 1972, and said that eventually what would happen is a day would come 
when all these children, both the indigos and the superpsychics, both the left and the right side of the brain of the world, stretching across all the countries of the world, would link and become a single living being. Just as you are 10 trillion cells in your body, they have all linked together and become you and have one will, one thought, and one path. And when all these children do this, if they do it, uh, which uh, there are people who believe that they're watching it starting to take place today, it's starting to happen this year, actually. Uh, if all those kids were to link together, they would be stronger than any religion, any government, anything. They would just take over the planet, and whatever they said happened would happen. And what did Jesus say about this? Jesus was re really clear about this particular time. He said that it would be the children who would lead the way. They would be the ones that would take us into uh, the higher levels of consciousness. And that's exactly what happened. He also said, or I believe that's what's going to happen. He also said another thing. He said that in terms of the second coming, of his second coming, that he would come in the, in the hearts of the multitude. In the hearts of the multitude. As the people, that's where the Christ, uh, the second coming, emerges. So between that understanding and the children, uh, you, you're going to see a phenomena happening over the earth over the next 10 years. That is, uh, the earth is going to change. We're going to be a different place completely. So that's what I feel about the children. Hello. Um, yo quiero, uh, lo puedo decir en español, ¿verdad? Lo puedo decir en español y lo traduzco. Ok. Uh, lo dije yo en México. Tengo a lo mejor más o menos como tres años que estoy recibiendo mensajes y yo no tengo mucho contacto con las computadoras. Apenas estoy aprendiendo. Pero alguien da mi dirección y llegan, llegan, perdón, llegan mensajes con el corazón. De, con el Sagrado Corazón de Jesús y me dedico a dar conferencias y efectivamente empecé yo a introducir eh, metáforas de, del Maestro y se me aparece por todos lados a todas horas y, y me quedo impresionado que en tu libro viene la, la segunda venida y lo estoy leyendo por todos lados y, y quiero creerlo quiero creer que es la promesa You want to believe in the in the second coming of Jesus? Well, I believe in it. <laughs> I believe it's, it will occur, but I don't believe it's going to happen in the way that most Christians believe it's going to happen. It isn't him coming here, though he may, <clears throat> but it's all of us becoming like him, becoming the Christ at once. That's the second coming. Okay. Any more? Okay. One more question, and I think we're then we're going to end. Okay. Bueno, yo quiero preguntar porque fue una coincidencia para venir aquí a la a la conferencia. Compré un libro uh, de la Cábala en donde menciona la Mercaba como carroza divina. Entonces, yo quería preguntar si es la misma que nosotros formamos, o sea, um, y habla de, del trono para encontrar el trono de Dios. Yeah, they're one and the same. The, the, the Kabbalah and also in the Torah uh, describe uh, the vehicle of light, uh, the Merkaba, uh, equally, and they are one and the same. It's the same thing. Okay, everybody, thank you. I hope this was helpful for you, and I love you guys. Okay, bye-bye.